Hello and welcome to the Archbishop's Corner. This is where we meet each week to talk with Hartford Archbishop Leonard Blair about faith, morals, the life of the church today, and how the gospel makes sense in an ever-changing world. This is where we go to find the answers to our lingering questions about the teachings of the church, living the faith life of a Catholic in contemporary society, and developing a stronger relationship with God. I'm Father John Gatzak, with many questions that you and I will ask Archbishop Blair as he responds to what matters to you in the Archbishop's Corner. Everyone's life is driven by something. What drives your life? Many are driven by things like guilt, resentment, anger, fear, materialism, and the need for approval. There are other forces that can drive your life, but all lead to the same dead end unused potential, unnecessary stress, and an unfulfilled life. The Bible has a remedy. St. Paul said to the Ephesians, Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the Master wants. And the Master himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we meet now in the Archbishop's Corner, where Archbishop Leonard Blair helps us think life through and search out the truth as we find the right way to faith. So thank you, Archbishop Blair, for sharing some time with us in the Archbishop's Corner. How are, how are you today? Very well. Today is Divine Mercy Sunday, which is a celebration, opportunity to reflect on how God's mercy touches our lives. How do you interpret the significance and the importance of this reality of divine mercy in our lives? Well, certainly the world today needs a great outpouring of mercy. You know, we're all up to our necks sometimes in our weaknesses, in the challenges and problems of life. And today, I think our society is becoming merciless. I mean, what, I, I don't look on the web or the blogosphere, whatever they call it, to see the kinds of things people are saying about one another mm. and uh, charging one another with and... But I guess it's pretty bad uh, that there's a lot of hatred, animosity, anger, rage, false uh, accusation, even though there are also things that, of course, are true, you know, of the sober uh, uh, information that people should have. But there's a lot that goes on there, too, that is very difficult and, and not, not good. So we need some mercy. People are merciless to one another nowadays. Uh, and I think it's exacerbated by the COVID that people uh, feel kind of pent up. And uh, I mean, even you hear about road rage, you know, where people mm -hmm. are dying on our streets because people are so angry that somebody cut them off. You know, all of this has to do with mercy, uh, that we have to be more patient with one another, more not, not a, this knee-jerk reaction uh, to everything that, that's angry. And for me, I believe it truly is a spiritual, a great spiritual uh, sickness. You know, it's not just about emotions and uh, and pressure and all that kind of stuff. That's all part of it. But there's a d deep spiritual problem here that we have to uh, we have to deal with. You know, mercy. You have to be merciful to ourselves. You know, there are people who who get so um, angry with themselves or so I don't know even become destructive of themselves, you know? All the terrible suicides we see uh, today, especially among young people. Uh, of course, it's no surprise when we have our legislature wanting to make suicide legal, admittedly not f not, not for, for people who are healthy, so they say, but nevertheless, uh, any person, and this has been shown in places where assisted suicide takes hold, that after physical problems, it starts to begin to apply to people who have psychological, emotional problems. Uh, but that's another matter. I'm simply trying to say that, that mercy has to do with uh, putting aside this terrible anger and judgment and frustration and attack on, on ourselves or other people uh, for whatever reason and, and being at peace because there is a merciful God in heaven, the judge of the living and the dead. And we have to we have to live by that divine mercy so that we can be agents of mercy ourselves. I think that you're you're so right on target because if you look at what's going on in our society today and all this talk about the cancel culture in which we live, when we're trying to cancel history, the past that we don't like because we're judging things of the past with our understanding of today's customs and morals, 
what we need is a greater ability to be merciful even to the past. Yes, uh, you don't. Well, of course, there are different degrees of that. I'm not saying that we should uh, uh, ever celebrate something that's evil, but when you, but when you, you know, with, from the past, but when you, when you, you always have to apply things in a historical context, you know, uh, and and have some appreciation of that. I think I've had occasion to say this before, you know, when in the New Testament, Saint Paul or Saint Peter say, "Slaves, be subject to your masters." Uh, but then also talking about how the master is a fellow, uh, 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 I mean, master and, and slave at the time are both uh, uh, servants of Christ and they're both uh, redeemed human beings. That was simply accepting at that time a social order that Christianity itself eventually recognized and worked to overcome. But if you say then that we can no longer read the epistles of Peter and Paul because they were they 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 dared to 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 say uh, that certain people back then were slaves, I mean you start to unravel human life and history in such a way that uh, is very very uh, problematic and it really doesn't uh, accomplish good in the end. You know I, I'm always amazed that people are rightly rightly indignant at those things from the past, but right now. Uh, in our country, there have been over 60 million children killed in abortion. Mm-hmm. And there may come a day when people look back and say, how could they possibly have done this? We should obliterate their memory from the face of the earth because they did these things. So we have to be careful how we how we judge everything. We have to put things in perspective. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying we should ever celebrate something that was evil. But when it comes to history... We have to understand things in the context of their times. There are a lot of evils going on today, as I say, that we don't always recognize or deal with as we should. And so again, we come back to this theme of mercy. You know, we are all sinners. We are all up to our necks in sin. It's only because of the grace of God that we are redeemed. That's a fundamental truth of Christianity and of biblical religion, that left to ourselves, we are not worthy of eternal life we are worthy, in fact, of punishment. But uh, God, in his great mercy, has given us the gift of his son, who through his own experience of utter mercilessness on the cross, because of our sins, has become the font of mercy and forgiveness for the world. Well, this devotion to divine mercy was actively promoted by St. John Paul II, who declared the second Sunday of Easter as Divine Mercy Sunday. Can you talk a little bit about the the history of the day? Now, this was from an apparition of St. Maria Faustina Kowalska back in 1931. She became kind of an apostle of divine mercy, but clearly, you know, the the concept of divine mercy does not originate with her. It it you know, one thinks of this, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, St. Margaret Mary, uh and other saints in in history who have been also kind of apostles of divine mercy, messengers of divine mercy. But in in the 20th century, uh, certainly St. Faustina was a very privileged soul uh, to have these private uh, revelations that the church has recognized as being authentic. You know, and especially happening on the eve of World War II, which at the time, because of Nazism and communism and the war, was an unparalleled period of cruelty and death, and uh, talking about the, the the mercy of God and how we need to to turn to the divine mercy, you know the prayer is uh, Jesus, I trust in you, and what a uh, what an important thing that is. So uh, that's connected with this uh, Sunday after Easter in the church's calendar uh, for those who wish to uh, honor this devotion. You talked a bit about stress uh, in our discussion just now. And this past year has had its fair share of difficulties that have caused stress, for sure. Well, this coming Friday is National Stress Awareness Day, which focuses on raising awareness of one of the leading health problems in the world today. Do you believe praying can help reduce stress? I just finished reading uh, Cardinal Sarah's book on silence. Mm -hmm. Um, Cardinal Sarah is really quite interesting. Um, You know, he's from Africa. And he, uh, uh, he until recently, because he turned 75 and re- retired from that office, but he was head of the Office of Divine Worship at the Vatican. And uh, Cardinal Serra has, uh, in collaboration with uh, another author, has, has uh, uh, been uh, responsible to pen several books 
uh, one of them being on silence. But uh, I, I think I, your question immediately uh, strikes me uh, uh, that silence has everything to do with it. Uh, you know, to be uh, recollected, to, to find uh, that space in our noisy world where we can be at peace and in communion uh, with God and ourselves and the world. Um, and, and I don't think we can emphasize that enough, how important that, that really is. So, so often people run away from silence. They try to find, they, they're uncomfortable in silence. Yes, well, we live in a very noisy world, you know, where, no offense to, uh, you know, the, your radio program, but uh, that where people can just have a radio playing all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, and, that's uh, true. Yeah. And, uh, and a television or, I don't know, something. I always, I found that a little strange that some people have to always have some back, they can't stand being quiet. And it does bother me that today in our churches, unlike in the past, uh, sometimes they're not very quiet. You know, people come in and they're talking and, and all this. It, it, it's important that the church, not that we shouldn't have a socialize after mass, for example, or whatever, but there should be a time when people come into church, especially before mass, uh, the quieter it is in there, the better to recollect our thoughts. And certainly after receiving Holy Communion, that we ought to take some moments in silence and offer our own personal prayer to Christ whom we have received uh, body and soul, and uh, body and blood, soul and divinity into our very selves. I do think that that's extremely important. Let's take a look at our gospel reading on this second Sunday of Easter. Our gospel is taken from John's gospel, the 20th chapter. So here's the gospel account as it is dramatically presented, after which we're going to find out from Archbishop Blair what his thoughts are and how we can relate this gospel to our own lives. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. My Lord and my God. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What are your thoughts, Archbishop, as we hear this powerful gospel? Well, again, we were talking about this being Divine Mercy Sunday, and the gospel is Christ appearing to his uh, uh, disciples behind the locked doors and uh, who were there in fear and saying, uh, peace be with you, uh, and receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So there certainly you have mercy, yeah. uh, the mercy of God that Jesus, who could have uh, 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 disowned and attacked the apostles for deserting him in uh, the Passion and the Crucifixion, who all ran away, and even worse, the head of them, St. Peter, uh, denied him three times. Judas, one of the twelve, betrayed him. He would have a lot not to forgive. But instead, he says, Shalom, peace be with you. What a relief to them, you know, uh, that, that Christ forgave them all along. 
And uh, of course, because they were truly sorrowful and broken by their own betrayal, you know, they had all said they would stand by him and their human weakness betrayed them and they all ran. So, but then he says something even more startling, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven them and whose sins you retain are retained. And of course, as we've said on many occasions in the past, this is part of the understanding of the sacrament of penance in the church that, uh, you know, Christ is actually imparted to them in his name, the gift of the Holy Spirit to forgive sins and to retain sins. That's quite uh, amazing, really quite remarkable and a huge, how should we say, responsibility entrusted to the apostles and to the church. The disciples were locked away out of fear. Peace be with you, Jesus says. What, is, what does that say to you about our own fears today? For instance, the fear of losing a job, the fear of making a commitment in marriage, fear of terrorism, fear of the coronavirus. There's so many fears that attack our modern lives. So does Jesus have anything to say to us today when, when we hear those words, peace be with you? Well, we're always in God's hands. You know, before we ever were born, every moment of our life is known to God. And this is, of course, a mysterious thing that uh, freedom and the divine will and yet God's uh, knowledge, you know, of, of all things. So no matter what happens to us, good or bad, uh, we are all uh, within the providence of God, provided that we, of course, always uh, entrust ourselves completely to that providence. And like Christ on the cross leading to the resurrection, we realize that even when bad things happen to us, yeah, evil things, deadly things, that we still remain in God's hands and God will bring good even in the face of evil. We won't understand it completely here below, but you have to remember this life is a flash in the pan compared to eternity, that everything that happens and, and its outcome is ultimately vindicated, understood in eternity. And uh, uh, life is very short and eternity is very long. So we have to live for, for what is to come. I mean, not that we, you know, are indifferent or abandoned or tuned out about this life, but we have to see this life always in the light of the things that last forever. Thomas is obviously not the only doubter. What does this gospel say to those who, like Thomas, say, unless I see the marks of the nails, I will not believe? Well, the only thing left to you is conversion, like Thomas had a conversion, that uh, if you don't, if you die unbelieving, well, we commend you to the mercy of God, but, you know, the, the goal is, uh, and, the, and God's desire is that we do believe. Uh, and I think God gives every person uh, in some way those signs and inklings and inspirations and graces and examples that people are invited to faith. We can say no to that, but, uh, you know, if, if a heart is hardened against faith, it's because a person has chosen or allowed their heart to be hardened. And God is always there knocking at the door, and we pray for people like that, that they will open the door eventually, even if it's on their deathbed, but that uh, to open the door to, to the grace and mercy of God. Archbishop, let's take a look at some of the questions that have been submitted by our listeners. For instance, Liz from Manchester says, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? What exactly was he saying? Did the Father turn his back on Jesus? No, Liz, I think what we're saying is Jesus in his humanity, because remember, Jesus is true God and true man, and that's a great, great mystery. That he, he, he on the cross, he was in the very depths of the humanity that he shared with you and me. And in this hour of human utter darkness and uh, abandonment and, and intense, intense suffering, uh, more intense than any suffering you and I could have because Jesus was absolutely uh, free from sin. I think Jesus was expressing the cry of, a, of, the, of the human being uh, in the midst of this kind of woe. So no, the Father did not turn his back on Jesus. Uh, and of course, we, we know the whole, in the context of the whole story, uh, how Jesus was raised up and, and, and he never abandoned the Father, nor did the Father abandon him. You know, you could also talk about the agony in the garden, where Jesus prays, Father, if, 
let this cup pass from me. You know, Jesus was horrified at this, the specter of, of this horrible suffering and cruel death. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. So this is the great mystery of God assuming a, a human nature to become one like us in all things and sin and bearing the full blunt of, of suffering, not just physical suffering, but the suffering of false accusation, of uh, hatred, uh, uh, even though innocent, of all those kinds of things for our redemption. Catherine from Wallingford says, I have heard some people claim that once a person accepts Christ into their lives, they are saved once and for all and never have to fear losing their salvation no matter what they may do. What is the Catholic view on this? Well, the Catholic view on this is that if, if you say yes uh, to a faith uh, and, and baptism, uh, yes, that you, you, you are uh, living a life in Christ, but that doesn't mean that you can then uh, live a, a life totally opposed to uh, what Christ has taught us to do. I don't see how anybody can read uh, anything in Scripture that way. I mean, uh, it's not like a, a vaccination uh, for COVID that once you get the vaccination, uh, you're free to do whatever you want and you're never going to get uh, uh, sick. If you, if you, you, you know, in this life, if you accepted the grace of God, you also have to uh, seek to grow in it and to hold fast to it, because of human freedom. So no, we don't, we don't believe that you're saved once for all, no matter what you do. Well, even with a vaccination, Archbishop, they don't really know how long the vaccination is going to last for. You may have well, to get a, true, yeah. a booster shot in the future. And you may, like, like the flu vaccination, you may have to get the vaccination every year for a different strain. I guess nothing is absolute and for certain, including once one says that he believes in Jesus Christ and, and he's saved, one must continue to live out the faith. Well, I mean, it's the dignity of the human person and the integrity of, of life. Uh, the dignity of the human person is such that we are always free human beings, although we're given the grace of God to make the right choices uh, in life. But but uh, we retain that freedom, you know, and the dignity. We we're, we don't become robots. Uh, we we have to constantly st seek to, to grow in. Uh, I mean, after all, it's about loving God above all things and your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, just because you are saved once by saying that you're going to live that way. And then you repudiate that, you contradict it at every turn. Uh, I don't see how we could say that, uh, you know, the person has, is, is uh, simply exonerated because they once were saved. Diane from Windsor Locks brings up an interesting theological debate. Diane says, while addressing a theological debate about whether the church should issue a dogmatic definition declaring Mary co-redemptrix in honor of her role in humanity's salvation, Pope Francis said during his general audience that Jesus entrusted the Virgin Mary to us as a mother, not as a co-redeemer. What are your thoughts on this theological debate regarding the Blessed Mother? Well, I don't think it's so much a debate. You know, the Second Vatican Council already uh, took up this issue and said that there's only, I mean, uh, there's only the one uh, mediator, uh, Christ, but that Mary is associated with him uh, in the work of redemption. And I think you'll find that Pope St. John Paul II, who was, as you know, extremely devoted to Our Lady, uh, never said that Mary was a co-redeemer, or I guess you'd say co-redemptrix. That terminology can be used in a way that is explained properly, but the, it seems to be, because it can be a, a misunderstood, it's probably best not to... Uh, and I, I think the Pope is, is quite correct in saying that that's, that's not the way it should be expressed. But again, when you say theological debate, uh, I think uh, in some ways this has already been uh, handled and discussed uh, by, by nothing less than a council of the Church, and certainly by someone like uh, Pope St. John Paul. Frank from New Britain says, I live alone and work long hours. So by the time I get home and finish all of my daily chores, I'm exhausted. I find it nearly impossible to keep up with my Bible reading. I schedule times to read my Bible, to pray, and to be alone with God. But I feel as if I am giving God only 15 minutes of my day, and I don't want that. 
The only real time I get now is the weekends, but it's not enough. In what practical ways can I beat back the busyness of my life to ensure I make time for God? What a question. Well, Frank, it's very admirable that, uh, uh, and you know, that you want to, to do these things, uh, to reading Scripture and praying, being alone with God. But I think, you know, there's no real uh, magic answer I can give you uh, to, to counter the, the, uh, the demands that are placed on your life. I think it, all of us have to live our faith in keeping with the duties of our state in life. So imagine that there's a nurse or a doctor who is as devoted as you are to wanting to pray, to read the scripture and be alone with God. But in the middle of COVID, they're working uh, an exhausting schedule uh, to help people stay alive. Well, you know, I think God is pleased with, with, uh, with what they're what they're do what they're, they should be doing you know their duty and charity and similarly for you 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 have your your obligations in life of work if you can find some way to uh make more time for the spiritual uh exercises you're talking about that's fine but if you can't then you do the best you can and uh, you know it's possible when you're when you're working and i don't know the nature of your work uh but you know that we can uh, also uh be praying and giving some thought to God uh, by offering him our work. In other words, those things are not uh, separated from prayer and, and uh, the presence of God. And, that, and in whatever way your work uh, serves the good of others, uh, that also is part of your relationship to God and your spiritual life. And I think we have time for one last question, Archbishop. This is from Alyssa from Guilford, who says, when I look at my Catholic calendar, it says that this week we were celebrating the octave of Easter. Didn't we celebrate an octave at Christmas as well? What should we do during the Easter octave? Well, uh, the octave simply means that it goes for the full week after, uh, you know, uh, and uh, not seven, but eight, because it's the two two Sundays. Um, so the octave of Easter. Uh so it's not tied to any one particular thing. I suppose you could say the octave of Pentecost Sunday, but the but the ones that are particularly observed are the octave of Easter, and uh, yes, there's an octave of Christmas as well, but it, it might not be expressed in quite that way. Any specific practice that one should or could perhaps take up during the eight days, the octave of, of Easter? Well, yes, because the whole point of the octave is that it's not just a one-day celebration, uh, that every day of the Easter week is like celebrating Easter all over again. In fact, that is a little different than Christmas because Christmas it doesn't have quite the same tradition as that. But every day of the Easter week is celebrated as if it were Easter in, in, the, in the Mass, you know. And that's because it's such a great, a glorious, and joy-filled occasion, uh, mystery, that we do it that way. So I think the important thing is, just like at Christmas, we don't want to, like the rest of the world, throw the Christmas tree out uh, the next morning, but realize that Christmas is meant to be celebrated as a season. Similarly, Easter, we don't want to just say Easter Sunday's done and so that's it. But uh, spiritually, in our religious exercises and such, we continue to uh, celebrate it for that week. Archbishop, we've come to the end of our time together. Can you close the program with a prayer and a blessing? Lord, without your mercy, we are lost, that we cannot hope to know, love, and serve you as we should, or to love one another in such a way that leads to eternal life. So we glorify you for the gift of mercy that has been poured out through the wounded heart of Christ on the cross and risen from the dead. And we pray that in begging your mercy for ourselves and for the world, we may be instruments of mercy too toward our neighbor, toward our family, our friends, those with whom we work, our fellow countrymen in these United States, that mercy may be more than just a sentiment or a word, but in our hearts and minds and souls and actions, it may be something that we display toward our neighbor every day. And may Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Archbishop, thank you for inviting us into the Archbishop's Corner. For sure, you have inspired in us this day an act of mercy that we should all do. We look forward to joining you next week. Until then, enjoy this time. Thank you. <laughs>